I am a bottom. What that means to you is that I'm a highly perceptive individual in regards to emotions and physical affection. This makes it particularly difficult for me to move on from anything, be it a favorite game, book, or movie. I have consumed the same sources of media for years. When Fallout 4 first came out at the tail end of November in 2015, I remember feeling excited to see what the new world held. As a lover of the world of Fallout 3 in Vegas, I figured it would be full of new experiences and opportunities, but I never ended up getting the game. Whether it was because I was broke and all I ate at the time was ramen noodles, or because somewhere deep down inside of me, I didn't want to leave my favorite characters behind. As the years went on, I suppose that I forgot about its existence. I continued to play the same games that I always have, and had no issue leaving Fallout 4 to move on without me. I even failed to really follow the development cycle. The DLCs, the gameplay, and the story were all foreign to me. I'm not going to lie to you and say that I'm a complete version of this game, as I have watched many amazing creators like Nurbit, Paul, Senza, and Crisis play through the game multiple times. But what I will say is that I have not played through the game for myself, and experienced what it was like just enjoying the process. I haven't done any challenge runs, and I haven't gotten much further than when you first meet Preston and Concord. Over the past month, I set out on stream to change this and release my bottom energy to the world. This video is the culmination of that journey. Go ahead and get on your thigh highs because we're about to see if I can beat Fallout 4. Like any other Fallout game, I start with creating my submissive and breedable boy. I just got out of a hard relationship with a woman who had long fingernails, and this has aged me as much as Obama's presidency did to him. It wasn't long before I named myself Peter Jordan. I don't know whether this was in lieu of Family Guy or Jordan Peterson, but a very creative individual gave me this name, and I will treasure it forever. I then proceeded to spend 5 minutes putting points into my registration form. In previous Fallout games, a special system was not directly connected to what perks you could get, and it was only a slight guideline for more high-level perks. For example, you needed 8 Endurance and level 30 to be able to obtain the perk and play at GRX and Fallout to Vegas. But in Fallout 4, the perk system allows you to get any perk as long as you have the associated special stat. Originally, when I set out for this character, I was going for a heavy weapons build, as I had not really experienced them very much in the other games. This led me to picking up a lot of strength and a decent amount of charisma and luck. Chet did help me out at this point to try to pick out these skills, but I'm going to let you know right now that they did a terrible job, bless their cute souls. After playing with a baby that I may or may not have wanted to kick like a football, I flirt with my wife a little bit, reminiscing about the times that she let me try cross-dressing. We then proceeded to play with the baby a little bit, tossing him back and forth in a game of aggressive catch. I'm pretty sure that we dropped him at least once or twice, but I think he'll turn out okay. It's not like there's a nuclear apocalypse or anything like that soon to approach us. After starting to run for my life due to the oncoming nuclear apocalypse, I left my wife behind like any good father would do in an attempt to find the sweet, sweet milk that I desired so gratefully. Todd Howard must have thought that this was a sin, because he proceeded to crash my game not once, but twice. This delayed me in getting through the security clearance, but ultimately, I was able to get my bussy inside before the nuclear bombs dropped. In this new environment that we found ourselves in, I expected a hot wax to be dripped all over my petite body, but my wife must have opted for a chillier package. Fortunately, the hitman that I had hired earlier to take her down and steal the baby came in clutch, so I didn't have to pay child support. I was even able to loot her dead body for a wedding ring, till death do us part. I spent a lot of time in the vault looking around for any supplies that would make my journey easier. I started with using a long cylindrical object simply because I had such a high strength before eventually finding the 10mm pistol. I found that I was reliving my younger memories of escaping Vault 101 and Fallout 3, and this brightened my spirits quite a bit after seeing my wife that I had already gotten significantly attached to get murdered. That said, it wasn't until that I had gotten my Pip-Boy that I really felt like I was at home once again in a Fallout game. Opening up a giant door and being blinded by Todd Howard's beautiful face, I loot a bunch of crates and various pieces of junk. Running over to Sanctuary, I didn't really feel like talking with Codsworth, so I bolted over to Dogmeat, the one companion in this game that doesn't talk. What can I say, I would rather you make moans of pleasure than moans of complaining about how much I hoard. At Red Rocket, I snuck into the cave below and dealt with multiple wool rats before obtaining a fusion core. These cute little potatoes will end up being my savior for this run and allow me to become the strongest power bottom that I've been in my entire life. Once in Concord, Dogmeat and I kill a bunch of raiders, and I really find myself enjoying the combat mechanics in this game. Between the quick looting system, long loading screens, and mannequins that don't have to give consent, I had a lot of fun playing through this area. Chad even helped me find a top secret bobby pin on top of the terminal to help me get the fusion core ahead of schedule. To reward them for their patronage, I threw on a cute little dress and proceeded to squad wipe all the raiders in this building. Oh. Do you guys see- oh. A stanky leg there. Okay. Up, 
Preston thought my dress was very attractive, but Sturgis thought that I could become better at water sports. I grabbed the perception bobblehead, spent another three minutes on a loading screen, and grabbed my first suit of power armor. When I jerked off that minigun and jumped off that building, I really felt like I was a part of something bigger. This giant suit of metal supports my undercarriage just perfectly, and they even have a spot for an automatic flashlight, which, although a little bit moldy, brought me a great deal of joy. With my massive erection, I was able to put down the death call much easier than what I really anticipated. For this first portion of the playthrough, I ended up starting with normal difficulty. While I am definitely an experienced FPS player, I felt like it would be best if I enjoyed the process for at least a little bit before making the game impossibly difficult and sexist against femboys. Preston agreed with me, and I returned to Sanctuary Hills to purchase my first perk points. I ended up sitting with Chad for quite some time to come up with what I should get, and it was commonly suggested that I go with Lone Wanderer, so I went with it and Idiot Savant. With no real direction, next I looked at Chad to tell me what to do, because I like being told what to do. I explored near Sanctuary for a little bit, grabbing supplies as I went, while killing multiple raiders. I ended up finding the robotics disposal ground, where I found my first magazine and said hello to the big beefy boy. It was at this point that I found my second suit of power armor. This game throws power armor at you like an automatic dildo machine, so it made perfectly logical sense why I wore it for so long. Equipping it, I deal with the satellite station Olivia. One of my favorite things to do in Fallout New Vegas is just to simply roam around. There are so many locations that aren't even accompanied with a quest that you can miss out on if you aren't wandering around. Fallout 4 doesn't change this, and allows you to explore whenever you see fit, regardless of whether or not you have a quest. I enjoy tramping my way through the dungeon and brutally murdering things with tire irons and molotovs. Chet had warned me of a great foe here that was armed with a minigun in the basement of this facility, but because of my pyromantic tendencies and my obvious perception, I was able to put them down before I even noticed their existence. I spent quite a lot of time looting this place and making sure that I have every nook and cranny. I even managed to grab a locket that apparently ended up being used on a later quest and a stealth magazine which will totally become part of my in-game build. After all, it is a Bethesda game, and I am forced to become a stealth archer whether I like it or not. I meet a man called Sully Mathis and he tells me to fix a bunch of pipes. I do just that and fend off several Mylurks before finding a sledgehammer leaning against the table with the help of chat. Obviously, heavy gun ammo is a rarity at the start of the game, so when I found this bad boy, I knew that I had to change my whole build around. After checking out the perks, Preston then teaches me how to doogie, and I proceed to scrap a bunch of things to upgrade the settlement. In this game, building is one of the newest additions to the Fallout franchise as compared to the previous games. I'm not going to tell you that I hated it, but I will tell you that there are certain improvements, especially with the inventory system within the settlement builder, that could be fixed. I think after time I got better with this system, but I did do most of the building off stream to avoid wasting people's time with me fumbling through the unorganized menus. After spending about 3 hours building, I lay on some mattresses, pick up an STD, and stop by Ten Blinds Buff for more Menament quests. On my way to my destination, I came across several feral ghouls, and Dogmean and I are definitely roughing up. The locations in Fallout 4 are arguably rather stereotypical with small touches that allow the structures to meld into the nearby landscape. With that said, I definitely felt myself getting lost with just general exploration. I spent a lot of time wandering around buildings, picking up scrap, but this was an amazing experience. It wasn't that I felt like I was wasting any time. In many other survival games, I always feel that I need to push and go faster to consume less resources to achieve a given goal, but Fallout 4 didn't make me feel like that. It allowed me to spend time working on my weapons, looking at dresses, and meandering my way through various shops. Comparison is often renowned as the Thief of Joy, but comparing Fallout 4's Super Duper Mart to Fallout 3's Super Duper Mart makes me appreciate how far the franchise has really come. Instead of raiders, the place is littered with ghouls. Rubble is found everywhere, and its wonderfully detailed with aspects of the structure seeming unique to it and only it. Perhaps one of my favorite parts about Fallout 4 is the way that the enemies seem to fit into their surroundings. Feral ghouls came out of the wall sphincters like bully mogs from Borderlands. Not to mention there are even tasty watermelons that you can find, suggesting that those with the ghoulussy can garden. The combat system, while not really smooth due to my skill issues, proved interesting and rather exciting even when largely sticking to melee. After railing somebody who was stuck in a wall and killing a few more feral ghouls, I returned to Sanctuary to grab my power armor in preparation for the large group of raiders at the Corvega assembly plant. While I was going in with the assumption that I could modify my suit to be full of devious devices like tasers, whips, and gags to be better prepared for the upcoming orgy of death, the raiders indicated that they would rather pin me to the cross and burn me alive rather than pin me to bed. I'm not quite sure exactly why raiders have copious amounts of molotovs always at their disposal, but it seems like that was definitely one of the things that they wrote on their Christmas list. For the longest time, I was consistently upset by the lack of drinkable water from toilets. 
But then I found a water fountain, and I felt like my whole life had finally come full circle. Well, you know I like activating finishers. I'm about to smash something, that's for sure. Scissors, finally. I can circumcise myself. That's outside, fuck. As combat continued to ramp up and I fought more and more enemies, I found myself accidentally going outside. In Fallout New Vegas, I consistently utilized leaving doors to give myself a little bit more room for error, but in Fallout 4, accidentally going outside cost you a 3 minute loading screen. This definitely makes the world feel a little bit slower, and despite having Fallout 4 on an SSD, this issue never resolved itself. I can't complain about this particular incident as it allowed me to return back to Sanctuary Hills to dump off a bunch of resources before once again re-entering Corvega to get to the lower sections. This was one of the most fun times that I had in combat in any Bethesda game. The power armor made me feel like I was connected with each of my swings, or in this case my bullets, and while it was slower, bulkier, and did not allow you to access crafting equipment, it certainly did a fantastic job of sucking up bullets coming your way. Finding another Grognag magazine and clearing out the rest of the raiders in Corvega, I am able to repair my power armor back in Sanctuary. Running across the Abernathy farm, I give Blake the locket that I found over in the satellite area by pure coincidence. I also came by a random doctor who stabbed me with a needle to make me feel good. The Commonwealth really is a fantastic place to live and raise a family. With Big Jim in hand with the help of a chat, I felt like I could take over the world. I was now officially a top. Until of course three seconds later, a legendary red scorpion appeared out of absolutely nowhere, and I ended up resorting to using fragmentation grenades instead of good old Big Jim. We did put it to quite the test with some mole rats so that I was able to explore an abandoned building before coming across what looked to be a cemetery. There were several traps and things that caused me to pucker my prostate just a little bit, as well as some nearby feral ghouls. Moving along, we came across a giant statue of a Mr. Handy. This location is known as General Atomic's Galleria. I had no clue what this place was about, but I wondered about it for a little while and I found myself in the ring with none other than the champ. I tried to fight fair, but with Dogmeat at my side I was unstoppable and I was able to beat him down. Unfortunately, I didn't really know what else to do here, so I just left because I couldn't pass the speech check. Perhaps one day we'll return, but until then I creeped down a dark crevice. That kind of reminded me of my first anal experience. I can remember it being incredibly wet. The sound of rushing water leaked out of my butthole, and then some old men that were rather wrinkled and potentially irradiated from their chemotherapy came onto me all at once. It was all a blur, but then one of them grunted so loud that it caused the others to stiffen their poles once again. In a certain way, it was kind of admirable and rather adorable. So anyways, that was the last time I ever went to a nursing home. I found Dogmeat's twin before brutally murdering him and getting in the sticky situation that caused me to die multiple times. It turns out that enemies can in fact follow you through a door. Wanting to protect my rear just a little bit more, I go back and grab my power armor and deal with the rest of the raiders. Putting one foot in front of the other, I came across Medford Memorial Hospital, where we ended up fighting multiple suit mutants. I ended up finding myself wandering through the halls much longer than what I really anticipated. It seemed like everywhere I went there was a big circle, over and over again, which if you know anything about hospitals, it's 100% accurate. They are all donuts, and if you are ever lost, just follow the left side of the hallway. Or was it the right? Once discharged in multiple capacities, I came across a settlement that was just a little bit creepy known as Covenant. I spent some time here answering some questions until I ultimately realized that it was the exact same from Fallout 3 and Bethesda was laughing in the recliners. Stepping inside of this nice peaceful town with no devious intentions, I learned that a robot has some lemonade available for me. Wanting that sweet sweet juice, I come across the people who bought it, only to find out that this isn't a quest for lemonade, but instead a quest to become Sherlock Holmes. After consulting chat, the random notes that I found, a strange terminal with way too many pieces of text, and the Hungry Caterpillar abridged edition, I spent what felt like forever walking across the bottom of the nearby pond with power armor. About halfway through I get conflicting messages about whether or not I had infinite air, and I had my foot up my rear to keep my sphincter open just large enough that I didn't receive any sort of constipation from this endeavor. Once inside I resorted to talking to all of them peacefully because I'm a very charismatic individual, and leave my house occasionally to touch grass. Hey, how's it going? We gotta kill the nerd. She was a freaking synth! I learned that Amelia is in fact a synth, although I do not care, so I reload a save, travel across the bridge that was lined with explosives that dogmeat really should have triggered at some point, 
and arrived at Bunker Hill with my worst for wear power armor. Old Man Stockton proves himself worthy of living, and he gives me a bunch of caps and a sign of appreciation for not killing him. After returning to base and storing all of my junk that I don't need to hold anymore in my prison wallet, I finally get the special book and apply it to intelligence so that I can become a big brain boy for Gunnut. Gunnut is a very useful skill because anytime that you fire a weapon, your gun secretes a certain special sauce that can be then utilized as adhesive. It's also high in protein, making it my personal choice for a healthy breakfast. Remember that legendary rad scorpion that we fought earlier? Yeah, it actually ended up getting us a fantastic legendary, a pipe rifle that just so happens to be explosive. That's right, baby, we have a makeshift spray and pray. We're about to spray and worship all over the place. My god, do I love worship, especially of the feet. While in Sanctuary Hills for a little while, I decided to scrap a bunch of things and start building more onto my settlement. I mentioned earlier about how the menus feel really unorganized, and I stand by that statement. That being said, the scrapping aspect is very satisfying. I also later installed two mods called Scrap Anything and Place Anywhere to be better able to maneuver around settlement building. I started by laying some prefab buildings and lining them with shack walls, but I couldn't quite get anything that I was super satisfied with. In hindsight, this was less about building something that I was proud of and more about building something functional. Unfortunately, when a settler did something that I didn't like by talking down to me about how the settlement was coming along, things got a little bit heated. <laughs> I reloaded a save that didn't exist. You see, I quick saved right before I killed the individual because it was supposed to be a joke. But unfortunately, the quick save did not stick. In other words, I wasted 15 minutes of stream time, everybody laughed at me, and I proved that even your actions in video games have serious consequences. With my future as a construction worker thrown into a trash can, I decided to resort to consuming copious amounts of drugs while renting out my body and killing a bunch of people. As I continued to explore, Dogmeat proved himself even more and more beautiful as I saw him carrying a shotgun between his mouth. I found even more legendaries and utilized different firearms to take down my foes, but ultimately I found myself in a rhythm, a rhythm of death. As I walked into the mass fusion building, I came across yet another summon full of gunners. Dogmeat and I then proceeded to tear them limb from limb. This also included their commander, which was one of the first enemies that I had faced that were wearing power armor. I don't recall doing any quests in these areas, and it was just more of exploring and wandering around, but then I came across a random structure that was familiar to even a sexually inadept person such as myself, Boston Commons. Boston Commons is a massive open area with a dirty looking pond in the center of it. Approaching this pond, a giant behemoth appears, and I engage in an intense combat. This is one of the most fun boss fights that I think I've ever had. The combat was tricky, but at the same time it was well paced, and I didn't feel like I was struggling too terribly. After looting his body, I then proceeded to read a lot more lore about Swan and find out that he was once a cute little breedable boy. Now entering in Park Street Station, I start brutally murdering all of the triggermen inside. Eventually, I spoke to Valentine, beat up Skinny Malone, and rebuild the settlement. This time around, I made something that I was a little bit more proud of, as well as the settlement recruitment station to get an even bigger orgy. The next day, I had my heart set out on reaching Diamond City. But as I moseyed my way along, I felt myself getting distracted by different quests and locations. I stopped by another scrapyard, Grey Garden, and Hangman's Alley. I'm not going to say that nothing is worthy of note in these areas, but I will gloss over it simply because all of this started to kind of blur together for me. Nothing particularly memorable stuck out outside of unlocking more settlements. This isn't to say that I was growing bored or uninspired, but the landscape is simply more of the same. There was an awful lot of murder, but I know that that is a big attraction in most games and especially so in the Fallout franchise. But then I had reached the location that I had set out for at the beginning of the day, Diamond City. 
gear was able to finally trade with a massive group of people and could sell a bunch of gear that I didn't need to both Mo and Arturo. Eventually, I found myself at Valentine's Detective Agency. He was grateful for my assistance with his rescue, and he decided to help me towards finding Kellogg. I know this might seem shocking with how I've played, but there is actually a storyline to this game. My wife was murdered, and my son was taken by Tony the Tiger, but tracking him down is going to be something that will have to be done later. We have more important matters to uncover. Traveling south a ways towards Milton's General Hospital, I come across several different super mutants. However, we aren't here to deal with green shucks. We are here to obtain perhaps the most important item in the entire game, Drip. Those of you who are a little bit older may look at Drip and say that that's an STD. Well, we're actually talking about some power armor paint. You see, you can modify your power armor to be different colors, and most sane people would pick one of the options that increases one of your abilities. Here at Directional Isle Studios, we decided to go a different approach. In order to get through this death trap, we had to solve several puzzles, overcome several traps, disarm what felt like hundreds of pressure plates, kill dozens of feral ghouls, and stumble across what appears to be in an abandoned safe house. Inside, we find the magazine that allows us to paint our power armor pink. Grabbing the dungeon's loot, I make it back to base, where I proceed to paint all of my power armor pink and appreciate its true beauty in the daylight. I may not be a very consistent man, but from here on out, we will be wearing pink power armor, or we will be wearing no power armor at all. Already at level 17 with a decent melee build setup, we now just needed quality of life and accessibility perks, like having a crippled girlfriend to get good seats at a ball game. With my desire to become ever more beefy, I began following the Brotherhood signal. It wasn't long before I helped out some strange guy who was confused about who he was. I get not knowing whether you're at top or bottom, but the solution is just to put on some cute socks and to do both. Either way, the dead people obtain death, part 2 electric boogaloo, and I met the rest of the team. Then being needier than a toddler in Sims 4, they had another quest for me. This saw me walking to Arcjet Systems, killing several cents, using a computer like a nerd, blasting dance in the rear, looting a bunch, killing some more, loading a bunch more, and having a heart to heart with dance before falling back to base with style. While dumping off my supplies and repairing my gear, I remembered that I helped that cute guy fix his pipes and was curious what became of him. With my curiosity bursting at my ridiculously tight dress, I head off to uncover the truth. After many murders, I learned that Sully soiled his pants. This caused him to become enraged and breed Myrlurks. If you're confused about the connection, it can be found within the lore that Myrlurks are actually great substitutes for washing machines. Wanting to help out Grey Garden, I head to the water treatment plant, where I kill a bunch of soup mutants and household appliances. This resulted in grateful robots who promised to tickle my butthole the next time I stop by. I stop by very frequently. Realizing that I should probably help save my child and get my doggo back, I return to Diamond City. I must confess that I'm a little bit shocked about how little I visited the Green Jewel given my over-reliance on the stores in the previous games. I'm not sure if I just felt satisfied enough without bartering, but this does change a little bit later. Back to the story, following dog meat really revealed my inexperience with the game, but it was a blast getting to work with the beautiful boy again. Once at Fort Hagen, I kill a few turrets and climb in the back door with the help of chat. Having two entrances can certainly be confusing. I know I've half reviewed the game and half got you aroused throughout this video, but I must say that Fallout 4 is a fantastic game. Oftentimes when we look at a game series, we expect to see the same things as the previous game and don't really appreciate it for what it is. I'd like to take a moment to compile all of my thoughts on streams into a single paragraph for your pleasure. Fallout 4 has great dungeons that mix variation with logical chaos, amazing weapons that are modifiable to the extreme, mechanics such as the hot keyable throwable and gun bashing to make combat even smoother, long loading times on a modern computer, and quests that feel as repetitive as the Thieves Guild quest from Skyrim. I won't compare this game to Fallout New Vegas simply because that would be like asking my father to pick his favorite son, his actual child or his stepchild. It's not fair for my brother and it's something that you already all know. What I'm trying to get across is that if you're anything like me and have put off playing Fallout 4 because you think it's bad according to other people's reviews, I strongly recommend you give it another shot. This game is fantastic for its own reasons and deserves a second chance. Kellogg, on the other hand, does not deserve a second chance. After killing my favorite cereal, I took a step outside to see the Brotherhood's blimp. Completing more of the story allows me to take a ride with Dance from the police station to the Prude one. Here's where my perception of the Brotherhood lost its rose-colored tint. I suddenly realized that they were arrogant, bossy, and not supportive of bottoms. Inside of the breathtaking structure, it felt claustrophobic, like Borderlands 3's Sanctuary, and I started to get upset that my whole plan for who I was going to side with for this playthrough was ruined because the Brotherhood wasn't likable at all. 
After facing that big disappointment, I decided to go take Molly. I mean, I decided to talk to Molly. You see, I went to this random lab where I decided to drink from a water fountain and follow a strange robot to my inevitable death. Here at the Polyerma Labs, we are tasked with uncovering the secrets of this facility. I learned pretty quick that this is a puzzle situation, and while I immediately expressed my doubts to those who joined the stream, I enjoyed killing a bunch of ghouls and traveling through the events while uncovering new sections of the facility. I ended up having to load different reagents and double check fabrication parameters to ultimately get the sacred gok juice. This allowed me to pick up the piezonucleic power armor chest, which increases action point regeneration speed when irradiated. Molly was so turned on by this that she was sent into a rage, and after cleaning up her robotic juices off my petite body, I kill a few suit mutants on the way to the castle. This whole deal is part of the Men and Men quest, which while I really don't care for them due to the repetitive quest line, I quickly realized that all of Fallout 4 is repetitive. I decided to help them because they were nice to me and even promoted me to general without me having to suck anything like I did for the big steel men. Here I powered up a recruitment beacon and returned to the Brotherhood like the toxic lover that I am. It is during this mission that I decided to up my difficulty from normal to very hard. As someone who plays on very hard in most games that I try, I'm usually a pretty cautious gamer, but up until this point I've been rather reckless because my power armor has made me feel really beefy. I'll be honest, this difficulty really didn't change much outside of the fact that I needed to hit things for extended periods of time rather than just a couple times. Occasionally I had to consume more resources than what I would originally expect, but outside of that the difficulty really wasn't difficult per se. Chat, the helpful beautiful cuties that they are, set me off to obtain a new weapon that would hopefully reduce the amount of wax that it took to kill something. This location is known as Dunwich Borrows, and it is home to many raiders and feral ghouls. The outside structure itself resembles that of a quarry, and along each of the levels are numerous raiders itching to die in my hands, grasping for oxygen as their eyeballs raise out of their socket and become bloodshot. Woo -woo. You've all gotten quite familiar with the way that my weapons sound from the past few cutaways, but the real gem of this location doesn't come around until much later, when I come across a scary looking pool of urine. Because I wish to bathe in the delicious juices, I hop out of my power armor and swim to the bottom, where I retrieve Krimis Tooth, as well as too many new. Getting my bussy out of there, I return to camp to upgrade my gear before finding Cricket, the drug consumer, not the one from Pinocchio. Taking a bunch of chems and selling my pre-war money, I obtain one of the most sought-after weapons in the entire game, Spray and Pray. Earlier I mentioned that I obtained this weapon in a lesser stature, and that was due to the explosive effect that I found on the pipe weapon that I had gotten from the legendary Rad Scorpion. But this weapon is a little bit more put together. In addition, it was also at this point that I obtained the Sniper Rifle a weapon that would be much better suited for longer range attacks against most enemies, or so I thought. Still feeling a little bit sad about how I treated Molly, I decided to go step into a robotics workshop to obtain more oil and aluminum. However, in the back half of the store, things got a little bit chaotic. Not only were there multiple Protectrons, but an Assaultron as well. Quite honestly, it's areas like these that bring me a great deal of joy. The enemies are slightly more unique than your standard Raiders, and the locations are full of loot that actually makes sense with it being a repair store. Not to mention, I love people on toilets. Something about that really turns me on. You know how just a second ago I mentioned that enemies took forever to kill? Yeah, well that was very well demonstrated by my sniper rifle. Sure, I don't have any perks to add to this weapon's damage at all, but you'd think a headshot would do more damage than a small tick of health. This caused me to once again return to melee and put the blade to a good test. Things got a little bit chaotic here with an Assaultron, but I can't say that it wasn't fun. Deeper in this facility, Mass Bay Medical Center, I introduced my flamboyant personality. Afterwards, I stuck outside to go see a fighting arena. Expecting a great deal of entertainment, I get a little bit more murder than what I had ordered. I have cracked the game's quest a couple times and the complete lack of a story, but these characters in particular really did feel vibrant, and I wish I would have been able to spend more time with them. That being said, I didn't consider talking with these characters again for pretty well the rest of the run, as I like dogs and I have taken the Lone Wanderer perk. After roleplaying that I was playing that one game that a lot of women play on the Switch, Stardew Valley or Starfield, I can never remember the difference. I came across Trinity Tower, yet another location full of soup mutants, I murdered my way to the top. No! 
the beefy boy known as Strong was introduced to me, and I was reminiscent of Fox from Fallout 3. Pretty well all I did with any additional companions, them being Dance, Kate, and Strong for this playthrough, was add them to my party and return them to Sanctuary Hills. This really was not a spy tour that I didn't really enjoy their characters, as I would love to learn more about them, especially Strong's milk addiction. There's just so much to this game that I wanted to look at, and companions would make Lone Runderer useless. So we've got to the part of the video where we're going to start chewing through the main story. This isn't to rush through the game, but it is to reduce the amount of time that I spend on this project. So yes, I am rushing through the game. After killing some suit mutants, I start making my way to the glowing sea. The various creatures that make the green mess their home prove quite devastating if ill-prepared, but fortunately Chad prepared me and taught me that medics counters poison. They also ease my worries about facing death claws head on, as it turns out that you can stun them near indefinitely. Now in Virgil's cave, we are trying to find a way to get to the institute. He suggests that as long as I'm able to help him, he can help me. With him being extremely cute, I feel morally obligated to follow through. I find myself at Green Tech Genetics, per his instruction. The place was full of gunners, and it was at this point that even on very hard difficulty, I found myself tearing through these enemies. Having an absolute blast, I meet up with the Courser, who I was able to put down in a really anticlimactic fight due to my superior bashing abilities. Spending about 20 minutes following the red line from the train station, I get to the railroad's top secret bunker and enter in a super difficult password. I then sit and chat for a little while, learning a little bit more about them, before I inevitably make the decision to flip a coin to see whether or not they live or die. I'm gonna flip it right now. I know, this is entertainment. Shut up, Lord. <laughs> heads. We take the heads off- I know, right? Creative. Hella creative. Sure, I felt a little bit like Harvey Dent at this point, but the blood on my sledgehammer suggested that I made the right decision. Once again returning to the Brotherhood of Steel, I aim to gain their assistance with setting up the teleporter to get to the Institute. When they tell me that I need to do more of their quests, although they were broken, long story, lots of internal bleeding, I get rather upset and beat them all down. I actually end up dying here because of how much laser action that my butthole received, but in the end I was victorious, and I might add that I was Victorium. Dan suffered the fate of my ex-girlfriend who's buried in my backyard, and I fight my way through an Assaultron to obtain new power armor. Sturges, a gentleman that is part of the Minutemen, is more than happy to assist me in building the teleporter. In other words, he sits there and tells me that I did a good job after I built the whole thing. I would have preferred him to call me a good boy, but he didn't get around to that. After painting my power armor my battle color, I meet my baby boy in the Institute. It turns out that he is not a gray-haired 12-year-old, but instead a 500-year-old man who looks like my exact copy. We end up having some brewskis, and he introduces me to one of his many lovers. As I trail my way through each of the departments, I learned that he not only has a team of scientists, but he has a team of hot scientists. Wanting to follow through and aid Virgil, I sneak into one of the back portions of the facility, do a little bit of hacking, and kill an Assaultron who is particularly troublesome. In the end, I was able to grab the serum, watch some cute apes, and return to my dad who isn't my dad but is actually my son. He sends me out to meet with the Courser who is now on our side, and it is there where I truly prove my strength against a bunch of raiders. I'm able to use a recall code to be able to get the synth back to the Institute per my father's request, and return the serum to Virgil. In hindsight, I don't know whether or not that this gentleman ever ended up getting cured. He could be dead for all I know, but I'm just going to pretend that he's Schrodinger's mutant and that he's neither alive nor dead. After a bunch of random meaningless quests later, I meet with Father on top of a dramatic balcony where we talk about the end of the world. Repairing my armor for one last go, I prepare for the final battle against the Brotherhood, even though I thought that I had already killed all of them. I hope you grab some lube because we're about to raw dog everything. Okay, we needed to attend the directorate meeting, whatever the hell that is. One of the circle jerks of all time. The feet in person versus cute pictures of feet, completely different, right? They're just entirely different. I was about to say my dad is kind of handsome, but he's literally my child. Wait, he's dying. Look, he's coming out to me. Jesus. Sometimes I just want to lick his beard, you know what I mean? Nothing sexual about it. Just just lick a beard. Nipples are a little bit puffy today, but that's, that's really the only thing to note. Do you imagine your last words being a moan of Ad Victorium? Like, oh, Ad Victorium. Something about bonking, it just turns me on, you know what I mean? There's nothing better than a good bonk. Oh my fucking god. That's hot. Rebel, do not be mean to my son. He may be old, but his head game is still good. 
you're fucking cute. I don't know about you guys, but when I when I play Minecraft, I just sit there and farm. I love wheat so much. Carrots? <clears throat> mm. This would be a really good time to kill father, too. Just back in the head. Excuse me, ma'am. You look like you have some nice price tissue. Can we dance together? I think it'd be cool to have a cat and then have him like be on your shoulder and then jump off of you and blind enemies. God damn, look at those feet. That's Mentats, actually, not Melons. That's Jet. Oh, jeez, I just... <laughs> what is this, Old World Blue? Oh my god, I was not expecting that. Dude, I have chills. Like, my nipples are hard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking idiot Savant. <laughs> <laughs> idiot Savant on the final quest of the game. Holy sh- it's still going. I came so much. So that was my playthrough of Fallout 4. If you laughed even once and aren't subscribed, really consider doing so. Not only would you make me moderately happy, but we'd be one step closer to be making sure that this channel doesn't die like my grandma. And hey, while I'm asking you for things, like the video harder than my erection, knowing that I'm finally done with this project. Thank you to my patrons for being unbelievably patient and paying me more than YouTube does. It turns out that a sexually charged owl with mommy issues isn't a niece that needs to be filled, but I'm gonna fill it anyways like I did your dad. And hey, do me a favor, will ya? Have a good one.